afternoon, everyone. Thanks for your flexibility and timing today. Uh, just a few things at the top, and then we'll get right to your questions. I am pleased to announce today that the Joint Task Force Red Hill in Hawaii has completed its defueling mission at the Red Hill Bulk Fuel Storage Facility, and that Secretary Austin has approved the transfer of command and control of the Red Hill facility to the United States Navy. Joint Task Force Red Hill, commanded by Vice Admiral John Wade, completed their mission to safely and expeditiously defuel the Red Hill bulk fuel storage facility roughly six months ahead of schedule from the original defueling plan. Rear Admiral Stephen Barnett, now dual-hatted as Commander of the Navy Region Hawaii and Commander of Na Navy Closure Task Force, will have overall responsibility for the final steps to ensure the safe closure of Red Hill. As you may recall, in March 2022, Secretary Austin directed the defueling and permanent closure of the Red Hill facility and established Joint Task Force Red Hill to lead the defueling efforts and maintain command and control of Red Hill bulk fuel storage facility. Last fall, the Secretary directed a conditions-based transition of command and control from the Joint Task Force to the Navy Closure Task Force with the Navy assuming responsibility for Red Hill upon completion of the defueling mission. On March 14th, Secretary Austin convened all key stakeholders to verify that all conditions for the transition to include final transition review and safety measure turnover had all been met. Joint Task Force Red Hill and Navy Closure Task Force Red Hill will hold a transfer of authority ceremony later today at the Battleship Missouri Memorial at 4 p.m. local time in Hawaii, 10 p.m. Eastern time. The ceremony will mark the official transfer of authority from JTF Red Hill to the newly established Navy Closure Task Force Red Hill as they assume full responsibility for the facility and its closure. And between mid-January and the end of March, the Navy Closure Task Force Red Hill was fully integrated with the JTF Red Hill team to ensure continuity of mission for safety, security, and community engagement. The Department of Defense and the United States Navy remain deeply committed to protecting the public's health and preserving the environment. The Navy will continue its work to safely close Red Hill while protecting the safety of the surrounding community and being responsible environmental stewards in Hawaii. The transfer of authority ceremony will be broadcast live on defense.gov. Switching gears, nearly 2,000 Marines and sailors arrived in Australia's Northern Territory this week to begin the 13th annual iteration of Marine Rotational Force Darwin, which strengthens the Australia-US alliance and our combined capabilities. Over the next six months, MRF Darwin will conduct a series of exercises and training events with the Australian Defense Force and other regional allies and partners <clears throat> to establish a forward postured crisis response force enhance interoperability between our forces, and contribute to a more stable and secure Indo-Pacific. For more information, please contact the U.S. Marines. And finally, as you may have seen earlier today, DOD's Chief Information Office released its Defense Industrial Base Cybersecurity Strategy. Spanning fiscal years 2024 through 2027, the DOD's Defense Industrial Base Cybersecurity Strategy provides a path forward for the Department's internal and industry-facing cybersecurity activities. The strategy's vision, mission goals, and objectives support the directives and priorities of the National Defense Strategy, the 2023 National Cybersecurity Strategy, and the 2023 DOD Cyber Strategy. And you can read more about this on defense.gov. With that, I'll be glad to take your questions. Uh, we've got Associated Press on the phone, so let's go with uh, Lita Baldor AP first. Hi, thanks, Pat. Um, Today, uh, General Brown said that some of the weapons that Israel has asked for and wants have not been provided by the United States, that they've um, asked for things that either the U.S. doesn't have the capacity to give or doesn't want to give. Can you um, add a little any more to that? Like, what types of weapons um, have, has the United States not provided to Israel that it wanted? And is it largely due to um, risk and what's available, or are there other things such as conditioning that on um, progress in humanitarian efforts that, that sort of uh, keyed into that? Yeah, thanks very much, Lita. Um, as you know, uh, we have a very longstanding security relationship with Israel, uh, and certainly after October 7th, 
Uh, we uh, worked very hard to, to rush security assistance to Israel in support of their efforts to defend themselves uh, against attacks from Hamas and future terrorist attacks. Um, and, and when it comes to the provision of, uh, of security assistance to include uh, weapons and weapon systems, uh, obviously, I, I don't want to get ahead of those conversations. Those are always ongoing conversations. Um, but through programs like foreign military finance, foreign military sales, uh, again, it, it's uh, part of our efforts, uh, longstanding efforts, to ensure Israel's qualitative military edge. Uh, but to, to get to your specific question, uh, I just I don't have any information to provide uh, beyond that. Thank you. In the room there, Haley. Thank you. Um, I'm hoping just to get a updates on a few things. One, on the Benavides and the army assets heading to Gaza, if those um, are still expecting to arrive on time or sort of what we can expect that. Um, and then also on the um, additional Abbey Gate review on sort of when that release uh, will be coming. And then anything you have, I know Congress is out, but um, any update you have on conversations Secretary Austin has had on the supplemental uh, with lawmakers, any talks he's having with them. Uh, sure. Uh, on the Abbey Gate review, I don't have a date to provide. Certainly, we'll we'll keep you updated on on that front uh, as well. U.S. Central Command. Um, when it comes to uh, the joint logistics over the shore capability, uh, the Bienvenides, um, and the other ships associated with that effort, uh, to my knowledge, everything's on track so far. We talked about the fact that that uh, we anticipate that that capability will be operational within 60 days. So we're, you know, uh, almost halfway there. Uh, but again, we'll uh, certainly keep you updated on that front. Uh, but again, right now, uh, based on the information I have, everything is, is proceeding according to schedule. Uh, in terms of the Secretary's engagement with the Hill, um, you know, I, I don't have any specific calls to read out to you now other than to say he uh, and the Department writ large can continue to remain actively engaged with Congress uh, and to work with Congress to try to get the supplemental passed. Uh, you've heard us say, you've heard the Secretary say many, many times uh, that it is vital uh, that we have that additional financial support uh, for multiple reasons, uh, not the least of which is to continue supporting Ukraine in their fight. Thank you. Will. Um, so Niger said yesterday that um, the U.S. Would, would at some point soon present a plan for the disengagement of American troops from the country. So is, is such a plan in the works and do you have any update on, on you know, uh, the status of U.S. forces there or, or, or their future in the country? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Will. Um, I did see that article. Um, I think you're familiar with the, the outlet uh, that it ran in. I, I really don't have anything on that. Um, to my knowledge, uh, you know, there continue to be ongoing uh, discussions at this time. We'll, of course, keep you updated if there's anything new. Uh, there's been no decisions made at this stage on the, the movement of U.S. forces, and we're still working to get clarification from the CNSP uh, in that regard. So we'll keep you updated. Let me go to Tom and then uh, two, two quick follow-ups. Uh, one is what led to the uh, six months early uh, action on Red Hill? You said they moved it six months in advance. And my second question is, has there been any more clarity on who will be uh, the NGOs that the U.S. will be working with once the pier is constructed in Gaza? Who will be uh, taking the aid from any more? Uh, on Tuesday, Sabrina was unsure. It's an ongoing thing, I realize. Any more clarity on that? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, on your first question, I just I think it's a real testament to the effectiveness uh, of Joint Task Force Red Hill, uh, the team led by Vice Admiral Wade, uh, and their commitment and dedication to uh, taking this task uh, very seriously for all the obvious reasons, not the least of which is uh, the, the public interest in ensuring that we're uh, doing right by the state of Hawaii and the people of uh, in Hawaii. And so, uh, you know, they worked expeditiously to do it as safely uh, as possible. Uh, and so, um, you know, obviously we're, we're very glad to see that things have moved along uh, quickly uh, and are confident that the Navy Closure Task Force Red Hill will continue that tradition. Um, in terms of the um, NGOs, uh, and the efforts to receive and distribute aid, as Sabrina highlighted, that work is still ongoing. Uh, USAID uh, has the point when it comes to, and State Department have the point when it comes to working with NGOs in that regard. Certainly the DOD is part of those conversations. 
I just don't want to get ahead of the process right now. But uh, as I mentioned to Haley, we'll, we'll be sure to keep you updated. You did, you did answer. Actually, anticipate my question. So USAID is going to be the essentially the point agency to deal with that end of the operation? Well, USAID is the point for the United States government when it comes to working with NGOs yeah. and humanitarian assistance as it relates to Gaza. So certainly we're working with state and AID on that front. Um, and again, we'll keep you okay. posted. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Daniel Compatangelo for the Italian television. So there's been, um, for many years in Europe, there's been on, ongoing talks about creating a military <coughs> force um, to protect Europe himself um, towards Russia and attacks, although being part of NATO, um, Europe appreciate what Biden, um, President Biden, been doing all those years to straighten the alliance. But what would the um, answer from the Pentagon um, if Euro would have their own military force to protect themselves. It's some, some states in Europe brought that up lately. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's certainly a, a question that Europeans and the European Union uh, would need to respond to. Uh, as you know, the United States has been committed to working with European nations uh, to include NATO for a very long time when it comes to European security. I think we all have a vested interest uh, in a secure, stable, peaceful, prosperous Europe, uh, as evidenced by the last 75 years. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to those kinds of decisions, those kinds of policy decisions, I, I just don't want to get into hypotheticals at this point. Uh, and so I'd refer you to the, the EU on that. Let me go to the phone here. Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Uh, thank you. So the defueling mission at Joint Task Red Hill is done. Does that mean all the petroleum-based substances are no longer in storage or that they still have to clean up sludge and, and other residue uh, in order to, com to make it completely clean? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, so, you know, right up front, uh, the department will remove every single drop of fuel from this, the facility uh, as we've been directed to do. And so what Joint Task Force Red Hill has done uh, is they've removed all the fuel in the bulk storage facility, bulk fuel storage facility uh, that could be accessed by either gravity flow or other non-destructive means. And so there's, there is a small quantity, approximately 4,000 gallons of known residual fuel uh, that remains in the facility. And so Navy Closure Task Force Red Hill, uh, they are best situated to remove this known residual fuel uh, as it can only be uh, removed by what's known as destructive means. And so, uh, in other words, thermal oxidation, uh, you know, uh, essentially in layman's terms, uh, as I understand it, you know, burning it out. Uh, but this is, uh, and, and this is covered in the Navy's closure plan. They will also, Navy Closure Task Force Red Hill will also uh, remove the pipelines as well as the sludge uh, that is in the bottom of the tanks. Uh, and they estimate there's approximately 28,000 gallons of sludge uh, in the bottom of those tanks, and they'll and they'll remove any unknown qual qualities or excuse me quantities of residual fuel or related product products in the facility until the bulk storage fuel facility is closed. Come back in the room here, yes, sir. Thank you. I have a couple on Ukrainian on ISIS. So with the newly approved budget, there is 300 million for the USAI program for Ukraine. Have you consider using those funds to procure additional items for Ukraine, like much needed artillery rounds, for example? Um, well, I, I think, you know, we've, we've been very clear when it comes to Ukraine. Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, we're going to continue to support them for the long haul. Second of all, we really need Congress uh, to pass the supplemental budget. Uh, that, that is the route uh, to ensuring that Ukraine has the support that it needs and, and the volume of support that it needs to continue, uh, continue the fight. But what about those 300 million now? Um, in terms of? USAA program, like procure rounds, send them to Ukraine when there's this gap. Yeah, again, I don't, I don't have anything uh, further to provide beyond that, so. One in ISIS, uh, has the Pentagon adjusted its force pressure anywhere in, in response to emerging threats from ISIS or ISIS-K? Uh, and has the Pentagon shared any additional threat intelligence with any countries? since the Moscow attack under a duty to, uh, to warn? Yeah, in, in terms of your last question on duty to warn, um, that, that's probably better addressed by the uh, uh, Director of National Intelligence 
uh, or State Department. I don't have anything from a DOD standpoint. Clearly, our policy is duty to warn. So if we have information uh, that we believe uh, needs to be shared to protect the lives of innocent civilians, we'll do that. And you've, you heard the White House uh, talk about the fact that we did share that information with Russia. Uh, why they chose to ignore it, I'd have to refer you, refer you to them. Uh, but clearly, this was an ISIS attack uh, that took place in Moscow. Uh, as it relates to ISIS, I think it's very important to understand that the Department of Defense has not taken its eye off of ISIS. When you look at our national defense strategy, it talks about counterterrorism, and it talks about the fact that we need to be prepared to address threats like ISIS, as evidenced by our ongoing efforts working with the international community in places like Iraq and Syria and elsewhere uh, to ensure that there is not uh, a resurgence of ISIS like what we saw back in, in 2014, uh, 2015. Thanks. Constantine. Thanks, Pat. Um, can you confirm reports from earlier this week that the uh, IDF has agreed to anchor the JLOTS pier to Gaza and provide a security <laughs> bubble? I can't. Uh, again, as I, I highlighted, we're continuing to work through the details. Uh, you know, certainly Israel is an important partner in the region and we'll continue to consult with them on that front. Uh, I just don't have any more details to provide right now. Um, and just to follow up on that, is there, do you get the sense that we'll have those details before the pier is set up? Of course, yeah. I mean, but you know, again, uh, it, it's a matter of wanting to make sure that we get you uh, factual, uh, finalized information, uh, recognizing, you know, there, there are OPSEC considerations, but also the fact that, you know, once those trucks start rolling off the causeway with aid, it's gonna be obvious. So we'll, we'll make sure that we get you that information. Time for a couple more. Yes, ma'am. Um, are MREs part of the aid package going for the Gazans? Uh, there was some discussion about this earlier today and whether uh, there might be um, a need for additional nutritional uh, content that's specific to developmental needs of the very young. Yeah, so it's a great question. So again, it's important to, to put the Department of Defense efforts into context as part of a broader U.S. and international effort to get aid into Gaza. And so the Department of Defense is one part of that bigger effort. Uh, and so MREs are a way that we can get uh, nutrition, get meals to people who urgently need that support, uh, recognizing that MREs obviously are, are made for uh, militaries, right? And so uh, they're very high in caloric content. Uh, they're very high in nutrition. Uh, but it's not the only type of aid that's going into Gaza, and it's not. It, it's uh, you know clear that more aid needs to be get, getting in, which is why again, uh, USAID, State Department, DoD working with the international community to do that. All right, take two more. Yes, ma'am. So I wanted to ask about you mentioned the DoD CIO's uh, release of the Defense Industrial Base Cybersecurity Strategy. How optimistic is the secretary about the work that needs to be done from the defense industrial base of ensuring up there through cybersecurity practices? Um, you know, not just traditional div companies, but you know, smaller companies, non-traditionals, and even software companies. Well, I mean, you know, as you highlight, um, it, it's not just uh, the big companies. It's also important to take care. Uh, t you know, think about uh, the subsidiaries, the subcontractors, the smaller companies. Uh, and that is a conversation that's always going on, right? Recognizing the fact that you want industry to be free, to be innovative and creative and, and have open systems where it makes sense, but at the same time recognizing uh, that within the bounds of privacy and propriety, we also don't want to do uh, something that's going to uh, potentially introduce vulnerabilities. And so those are the kinds of conversations uh, that happen at multiple levels uh, and certainly something that, that the Secretary is aware of and something that the Department will take into account. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask about Ospreys. Um, have you had any reports of trouble since the Osprey Sprite uh, suspension was lifted? And uh, is the investigation still ongoing? Uh, so to my knowledge, uh, the Air Force investigation is still ongoing. Um, I'd have to refer you to the services for specifics on the, the current status of their aircraft. I'm not aware of any issues uh, at this time, but again, I'd have to refer you to the uh, individual services. Thanks very much, everybody. Appreciate it.